1939, America is overtaken by the Great Depression. The world braces for World War II, and in South Dakota, a killer is born. It is not an easy thing to break a human being's jaw. Jerry Brutus was born to a mother who despised him from the moment she found out he was a boy, preferring a girl instead of a second son. He was subjected to constant physical and mental abuse, while his older brother Larry was treated with love and affection by their mother. One day, a young Jerry finds himself playing in a junkyard, a dirty, disgusting place rife with dangers, especially for a five-year-old. It was in this dystopian playground that Jerry came across what would blossom into a fascination that would lead him to taking the lives of four women, a discarded pair of stilettos. His mother, despite forcing him to wear female clothing, was so irate that when she found the heels, she burned them. Jerry and his family move, settling into a new home in Riverton, California, where Jerry likewise attends a new school. His female teacher not only wears high heels, but keeps two additional pairs of heels in the classroom. Young Jerry attempts to steal the pair beneath her desk, but is caught in the act. Jerry failed the second grade and complained of frequent headaches which inhibited his ability to see clearly. But when he was taken for an eye exam, the doctor found no reason for him to have glasses. The doctors prescribed something akin to a placebo, but the headaches persisted. He was eventually given an IQ test, but he was within the normal range, and later in life, he had an above-average IQ. During the same time frame, Jerry was diagnosed with measles, sore throats, swollen glands, laryngitis, and underwent several operations to fight fungal infections. Jerry's family moved frequently in his youth. And when Jerry was eight, he and his family moved to a home in Oregon, where the neighboring family had several daughters. Jerry would sneak into the neighbor's house to play with the girl's clothing, and it was here that his shoe fetish escalated into an undergarment fetish. A young lady visited the Brudos home, a friend of the family, and being comfortable with a then-child Jerry, she decided to rest on his bed. Jerry, unable to control his urges, took this opportunity to attempt to steal her shoes. As time passed, Jerry eventually became a teenager, but he didn't mature out of his adolescent fascination with shoes. In fact, the opposite happened, and the urges only became stronger, leading Jerry to not only attempt to steal shoes in a passive fashion, but to stalk, beat, and choke women until they lost their consciousness, all to guarantee that he would be able to steal their shoes. However, even that wouldn't be enough, and soon the fantasies escalated to Jerry wanting illicit photographs of females. Jerry's violence came to the fore, and in his selfish quest of fulfilling his fantasies, he devised an insidious ruse. He stole an 18-year-old woman's particulars and then told her to come to his house and he'd help her get them back, presumably pretending to be an innocent, concerned third-party friend willing to confront the predator who took her clothing. When the girl came to his house, she was confronted by a masked man with a knife who forced her to undress while he took several photos of her, and then he left. The shaken, terrified girl got dressed and quickly began to leave when Jerry approached, claiming that he had seen the man, but was locked in a shed. She told the police what happened, but seemingly nothing came of it. The next event occurs when Jerry is 17. Pulling from different sources to create the horrific image of what happened, it begins with Jerry finding a hillside where he'd dig a hole, a hole where he intended to keep his female sex slaves. He approached a female with a knife, abducted her, beat her, and threatened to stab her if she did not follow his instructions, and of course with the intention of eventually taking her shoes home with him. However, Brutus was caught in the act by a concerned couple who witnessed the unusual behavior and upon their questioning, Brutus claimed he was only trying to help the girl and wasn't the perpetrator. Fortunately, the couple didn't believe him and reported him to the police. Police searched Jerry's home, finding the stolen clothing, the inappropriate photographs, and Jerry was arrested for assault and battery, confessing to the assault on the young lady. After Jerry's arrest, he was taken to the psychiatric ward at Oregon State Hospital, where he'd stay for nine months. Psychiatrists were made aware of his dark fantasies, 
fantasies that involved kidnapping women, putting their bodies in the freezer, and arranging them into provocative poses. They were made aware of his hatred for his mother and women generally. The psychiatrist decided to diagnose him with schizophrenia, which is reportedly not an uncommon diagnosis of the time, and he was deemed to not be a threat to society despite these revelations in his previous arrest of assault. And he was released back into the world where he'd soon graduate high school and join the military. However, his stint in the military wasn't long. Jerry informed the psychiatrist in the military that he was having dreams of a Korean woman seducing him, and after he was discharged, possibly for bizarre obsessions. Out of the military, Jerry had nowhere to go, so he moved back to his parents' house. However, it wasn't a warm reception, and he was relegated to living in a shed in the backyard. It was after this that he'd find his next victim. He left the shed one evening and had seen a girl who excited him. He followed her, knocked her out, and stole her shoes, just as he had done years ago prior to being committed to the psychiatric ward. When Jerry was 21, he obtained his FCC license and began working at a radio station where he'd meet his then 17-year-old future wife who he married shortly after meeting and moved to Oregon to live a seemingly normal life. In fact, the stalking, assault, and shoe stealing even stopped for a time. Neighbors report that he was a devoted family man who didn't drink, smoke, or even use profanities. We were expecting you, Helen. Women flock to an engagement ring like bees to the honeysuckle. This is certainly a gala evening. However, behind closed doors it was a different story, where his bride was forced to do chores wearing only high heels and engage in his unusual demands. His wife Darcy bears him a child, and during the early years of their marriage, there are no reports of him stealing shoes or accosting women. Darcy becomes pregnant again, and this time she's going to have a son, something that thrills Jerry. However, Darcy, frustrated with Jerry, who had treated her poorly, refuses him entry to the hospital room when she's giving birth, a move that sends Jerry spiraling back into old habits. Jerry began complaining of migraines and blackouts, and he began to steal undergarments as a remedy for the headaches, with the new addition of Jerry dressing in drag. Turn around, dear. Blue and gray with a matching cape. Patsy looks like a peppermint stick in her red and white candy stripes. One night, shrouded in the cover of darkness, he had seen a woman, or more specifically, he had seen her shoes. Engulfed in his obsession, he stalked her home, waiting outside for her to fall asleep so he could steal those shoes that had excited him so much. With only the moon as a witness, he crept into the home, an imposing, dangerous man traversing the halls of this woman's home as she slept. However, she heard him, a horrible mistake, because Jerry was so ensnared in his fantasy that he choked her unconscious, defiled her, and then stole the shoes. The following begins the confessed murders of four women. Due to the gruesome nature of their deaths and the horrific aftermath, and out of respect for the victims and their families, I won't get into every detail. Suffice it to say, there is a reason that Jerry's media names are The Lust Killer and The Shoe Fetish Slayer. In 1968, 19-year-old Linda Swanson knocks on Brudos's door in an effort to sell encyclopedias. Under the guise of interest in buying an encyclopedia, Linda was lured into the home and eventually the basement, where Jerry would eventually take her life, all while his wife and children were in the home. He kept her foot in the freezer to model shoes. In late November, 23-year-old Jam Whitney's car breaks down. Brutus offered to give her a ride to his house so she could use his telephone and she accepted. After getting in the car, she was horrifically killed and transported back to Jerry's garage. In late March, 18-year-old Karen Sprinkler goes missing. Two young ladies report that a large man dressed in drag was on the parking garage roof where Karen's abandoned car was found on the day that Karen went missing. It is reported that Brutus abducted her at gunpoint, took her home to his garage, and eventually killed her. Brutus' family is away, and a drunk driver crashes into their home, leaving a hole large enough to see inside. Jerry would later say to detectives, 
bat was close when recalling the incident, because despite being able to see into the home, along with the scent of decomposition, no one looked, not even the police. Jerry was able to go home, wrap one of the girls in plastic, and put her in another building in the yard, and invite cops over to inspect, all without anyone noticing anything amiss. Not long after, 22-year-old Linda Salee is abducted from a mall's parking lot and eventually killed, keeping her in his garage. Brutus attacked other women too. Gloria Smith, 15, and Sharon Wood, 24. However, they were able to get away. The sound of an intercom, perhaps the same sound that Jerry would hear when his wife, prohibited from entering the garage, wanted to speak with him. Keep her from finding his trophies and amputated body parts and at times seeing women in the garage. She was forced to ring when she needed to talk with him. It's a beautiful May day, temperatures averaging in the 70s in the afternoon, and a gentleman decides to go on a relaxing fishing trip. However, it would be anything but relaxing, but he caught something that would lead to much more than dinner. He was instrumental in catching a killer. This unnamed individual found the body of Sully, and the cops would then find Sprinkler weighed down with car parts and metal in the Long Tom River, a tributary of the Willamette River where Brutus had been leaving bodies. As police diligently try to find the monster behind the deaths of these young women, they go to college campuses and begin asking students if there was anyone unusual. They were on the right path. Brutus had been cold calling dorms in an attempt to arrange blind dates with college girls college girls who Jerry had been compiling information on in his garage. Names, addresses, phone numbers, sororities, living organizations. Jerry would call, claiming to be a lonely Vietnam veteran. One girl accepted and was fortunately able to leave the encounter with Brutus unharmed, except that he had casually mentioned the bodies found in the river and reportedly mentioned how he could strangle her. Clearly, this isn't something that someone forgets easily, so when cops began asking questions, she informed them of the strange conversation. The cops set a trap for Brutus with the young lady's help, using her to set up another date with Jerry, who promptly agreed. However, when he showed up, it wouldn't be the girl he expected. Instead, he was confronted with detectives. Somehow, the detectives ended up in his garage. Whether that was by search warrant or opportunity is unclear, but what is clear is what they found. They found copper wire, cut with the same tool used to cut the copper wire that was found with the girls' bodies in the river. They found dozens of photographs of women posed in provocative positions just as Jerry had fantasized about to a psychiatrist all of those years ago, and body parts kept in his freezer, including breasts, which he had intended to use as paperweights and for molds. Jerry was arrested and confessed. He was found guilty of the murders of Sprinkler, Whitney, whose body was recovered a month after Brutus' conviction, and Sully. But despite confessing to the death of Slauson, he wasn't charged because they were unable to find her body and only had photos of her foot, not her entire body. Jerry reportedly confessed to the murder of Stephanie Vico, 16, but there was not enough physical evidence to charge him. Jerry's jail cell was filled with shoe magazines, but despite this, life in jail was difficult with reports of buckets of water being thrown at his head and in 1970 being treated for rectal bleeding caused by hemorrhoids or other. Jerome, Jerry Brutos, the lust killer, the shoe fetish slayer, died from liver cancer in 2006. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe. This is my first video and if you'd be willing to offer any feedback, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. I will close this video with a photograph of the girls who lost their lives to Jerome Brutos. They should be remembered much more than this heinous killer. Good night.